I think it's safe to say that Limsa Liminza is the unofficial hub for social activity, at least when it comes to the player base. From bard performances, to random dance parties, to those RMT bots that always seem to be there no matter how many times you report them, Limsa Liminza is always a lively place in terms of gameplay. But what about the lore? How was Limsa established, and how did a haven for pirates and swashbucklers become one of Eorzea's most prominent settlements? Hello, I'm the Sawdex Arc, and today we're talking about Limsa Liminza. Now, for a city-state with a culture and way of life almost entirely revolving around the sea, it might not be much of a surprise to you that the founders of Limsa Liminza were in fact sailors. These sailors were Rogadins hailing from the far reaches of Erzland, an archipelago located in the vast seas of the Northern Empty. The Northern Empty, as its name suggests, is a vast, sparse ocean that lies to the north of Aldenard. It's devoid of any major landmasses, with the exception of Erzland itself and Old Charlian, both of which are rather small islands in comparison. Not much is known about the history or culture of Erzland, but at some point before or during the Sixth Astral Era, it somehow came under the rule of a tyrannical regime. Whether this was a recent development or how the nation had been run up until this point is anyone's guess, but it was enough for a large collection of angry sea wolf Rogadin to rise up and revolt against their ruler. They amassed a vast armada and rebelled, but much of their forces were destroyed, leaving only a single vessel, the Galadian, still standing. This last vessel went from a symbol of rebellion to the last vestiges of hope for the remaining sea wolves looking to flee their oppressive rulers. They set sail with the vessel, crippled from naval combat, in 874 and set off on a year-long journey plagued with problems. Eventually, the ship drifted to the southern shores of Vilbrandt and ran aground. Having finally landed, the crew of the Galadian scouted ahead and discovered that the land was in fact fertile, which was enough for the remaining crew of the Galadian to disembark and claim the land as their new home. They named the land Lenosha, after a fallen crewmate who had unfortunately died of scurvy only two days prior to landfall. They set up a village and began using the land for farming. Unfortunately, even though they claimed the land for themselves, it wasn't exactly theirs. In fact, much of Vilbrandt was the territory of the Kobolds. There were a few skirmishes, but the crew of the Galadian were unable to fight off the Kobolds, and were forced to retreat back to the safety of their grounded vessel. Using their ship as a base, they built bridges to the various small islands and exposed reefs of the coast, and the humble beginnings of Limsa Liminza were born. Unfortunately for the new Liminzans, life in their sea vessel turned coastal city was pretty abysmal. Deprived of much of the fertile land by the Kobolds, the new settlement floundered, with many of its citizens living in squalor. In desperation, they turned to the one thing they had left, their knowledge of sailing. Using the lumber from what few coastal forests they had access to, they constructed fast warships and began attacking merchant vessels sailing the Rotano Sea, off the south coast of Vilbrandt. Their experience with sailing and their superior shipbuilding skills left even the most well-defended merchant ships outclassed. They stole riches from their victims and established a black market to sell the plundered goods. The city that was once suffering in poverty was now a thriving pirate haven. Able to sell their goods for much cheaper due to them being stolen, they were able to draw the interest of plainsfolk from the South Sea Isles. Captured sailors were given the choice to join the Liminzans pirate ranks, many of whom were here or Seekers of the Sun. What was once a city ruled and largely populated by sea wolves was now filled with a diverse population of the spoken races all thriving under a city largely ruled by piracy. However, as pirate crews grew more massive, power struggles began to rise amongst the largest crews in the city. Disputes over territory and claims to plunder erupted into violent conflict in the year 940, with the city of Limsa Liminza itself serving as the backdrop for the war. Pirate factions would strike against each other in the streets, sometimes with unfortunate innocents or merchants caught in the crosswire. This gang war-like conflict lasted for over two decades until a sea wolf named Agarzar Rolmerlzen rose to the rank of Admiral of Limsa Liminza. Agarzar was a well-respected and powerful man with a pirate background himself. With his influence, he invited many of the warring pirate crews to a negotiation. Through a combination of threats and bartering, he was actually able to secure their agreement to cease the fighting altogether, and was also able to establish a code of conduct that all pirate crews were to follow. No crewmates were to cheat another out of their plunder, no pirate was to steal from a fellow Liminzin, and none were to deal in slave trade. He also established the Upright Thieves, a secret guild that operated in the shadows and punished anyone who broke the code. Because members of the Thieves' Guild were not a direct policing force mandated by the Admiral, but were instead a secret organization operating from the back alleys, they instilled a greater level of fear from the pirates of Limsa Liminza, and thus many respected the code and its tenets. 
It was also under the leadership of Admiral Agazar that Limza Laminza's control was able to expand out into southern Lenosha, in part due to his efforts to reinforce the Knights of Barracuda, which was the then-official Laminza Navy. The pirates, no longer fighting amongst themselves, could turn their attention back to piracy, while the Barracuda focused on securing land and defending the harbors and ports of the city. It was also around this time that an agreement between the Laminzans and the Kobolds would be codified, allowing the Laminzans access to Lower Lenosha, while the Kobolds could keep their home of Ugomoro in Upper Lenosha. Notice how I said an agreement, and not the agreement. Now, some spoilers here for those who haven't completed 5.4 yet, but Merle Webb mentions a peace agreement made between the Laminzans and the Kobolds that was left intentionally vague and quickly broken by the Laminzans, breaking their trust. But as it turns out, that wasn't the first or only agreement the Laminzans would make with the Kobolds, only to break later. No, no wonder the Kobolds weren't ready to trust the Laminzans after that. Despite their penchant for betraying the Kobolds and their conflicts with not one but two primals, Titan and Leviathan, Limza Laminza prospered for centuries under a golden age of piracy and black market commerce. However, despite their prosperity, their reputation as a lawless pirate haven, and their tendency to antagonize and attack merchants from the other city-states made Limza Laminza a bit of an undesirable location for outsiders, and severely hampered legitimate trade despite their strategic location as a port town. This would all change, however, in 1567, when Merlewib Blofuswin would rise to position of Admiral. Her first act as Admiral was to declare piracy illegal, an action that sparked both shock and outrage throughout Limza Laminza. The order was met with incredible backlash, and many went after Merle Webb's life. However, she wouldn't move on her position, and for good reason. With the rising threat of the Garlean Empire on the horizon, she knew that Limza Laminza could not stand on their own, and she knew that the other city-states would be hesitant, if not downright opposed, to lending aid to a nation of pirates who had attacked their own ships on countless occasions. Limza Laminza had previously aided in both the Autumn War and the Battle of Silver Tear Skies, but both of those alliances were tenuous at best, and the alliance had officially disbanded after Ishgard withdrew their troops. Through force of will and her own skills as a former pirate, she negotiated with what crews she could and actually got most to agree to her orders, crushing what crews she couldn't. She also allocated funds to hire the famed mercenaries the Company of Heroes, which would come to fruition when they would stand against and vanquish both Titan and Leviathan in a two-year period. This did a lot to garner support from the Laminzans, as did the Galadian Accord. The Galadian Accord was an agreement signed between the Admiral and all remaining pirate crews in Limza Laminza, making them official privateers of the Maelstrom, thus binding them to her direct command. This would allow them to resume their pirate activities, but only against Garlean vessels and other designated targets. Merlewib's foresight to outlaw piracy and strengthen Limza Laminza's relationship with the other city-states definitely paid off, as they took place on the eve of the Battle of Karnu in the Seventh Umbral Era, the greatest conflict Eorzea as a whole would ever see. She, along with the leaders of the other city-states, minus Ishgard, reformed the Eorzean alliance, and in the ensuing calamity and lingering chaos that would result, Merlewib and Limza Laminza as a whole would fight to survive in the Change Realm. Once again, beyond this point, we pretty much see the role Limza Laminza plays during the course of Final Fantasy XIV, so let's move on to discussing their culture. As mentioned before, Limza Laminza is inseparably connected to sailing and its roots as a port city run by pirates. Because of this, and their high population of Seawolf Roganin, much of their cuisine and culture is centered around the sea. Seafood, shellfish, dried meats, and pickled and preserved dishes, which were essential on long sea voyages, remain prominent in their diet. Due to their position as a port town, they also often incorporate foreign spices and various exotic ingredients into their dishes. They're also particularly well known for their production of ales and wines, made with the plentiful grapes and wheat that grows in the soil of Lower Lenosha. Naturally, they also have a penchant for fishing and shipbuilding, but these aren't the only crafts that they are adept with. Due to their fleeting and brief peace with the Kobolds, Laminzans were able to learn advanced metalworking techniques, which have been passed down by the city's blacksmithing and armorsmithing guilds. Unlike pre-Heaven's Ward Ishgard, Gridania, or Oda, the government of Limza Laminza is much more loose and less restrictive on its citizens, although some structure is in place to ensure the city doesn't fall into complete anarchy. The Admiral is considered the leader of Limza Laminza and commands the Maelstrom, a grand company made up of both the proper Laminzan navy, called the Crimson Fleet, the Yellow Jackets, the Maelstrom's land-based forces, and the many privateers bound to the Maelstrom through the Galadian Accords. The Admiral was once a position passed down by nomination by the previous Admiral prior to their death or resignation. However, our old friend Admiral Agazar introduced a system that would prevent any potential conflicts or wars of succession from arising in the future, 
the Trident. The Trident is a three-part naval race that involves circumnavigating the lower half of Vobrant. Not much is known about the race's specifics, but generally speaking, only captains were considered skilled enough to participate. Sinking the opponent's ships was not only not prohibited, but it was actually encouraged, making this as much of a contest of naval strength as it was skill. The winner of the race becomes the new Admiral. The Admiral does have power to make sweeping political changes, though as mentioned before with Merwood's outlawed piracy, any drastic changes could easily be met with backlash and opposition, and if it weren't for Merwood's strong will and cold calculation, she would have easily been killed and replaced before her policies were solidified in Lemons and Law. Merlwib's continuous struggle with powerful forces within Limsa Lemins' own culture is a continuous theme that was explored as recently as 5.4's story. Though with that story, it does seem that putting an end to those internal power struggles, as well as their struggles with the Beast Tribes, are Merlwib's primary focus moving forwards. There's so much and more I can talk about in regards to Limsa Liminza, but I think I'm going to end this video here. I know it seems like I glossed over a lot of the topics, and I didn't go into as much detail as I could have, but the purpose of these videos about the city-states is to just provide a brief history of how they got where they are in the current game, and talk about the different cultures present in Eorzea. Also, I know I keep saying this, but I am going to try to ramp up video production moving forwards, and I already have some ideas for shorter, less serious videos to hold you guys over between these big lore ones. I also do still have a really big discussion video in the works coming up, but I really want to take my time with that one to make sure everything is well backed up and researched. Also, also, it's been a while since I mentioned this, but I do stream on Tuesdays and Saturdays, and sometimes Thursdays, over on Twitch. Mostly Final Fantasy XIV, and I'm 9 followers away from the minimum 50 you need for affiliate. So I'd really appreciate you guys checking me out, and potentially following me over there if you're interested in some less serious stream-based shenanigans. Other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, do be sure to give it a like. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, be sure to drop them down below, and subscribe if you want more Final Fantasy XIV content from me. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.